What is up, y'all? We are here for our secret Saturday night sermon. It's after midnight, and we are doing our weekly segment, Secret Teachings of Jesus, where I delve into the Gnostic Gospels, and we explore them together. So currently, I am in the Nag Hammadi scriptures. We have been reading through the Gospel of Philip for some months now. Um, if you go to my channel, there's a playlist called Secret Teachings of Jesus, and every week I pick out a portion from the Gnostics and we talk about it and I read it, you know, right before I go on camera, I find a passage that stands out and then I read it to you guys and we unpack it and I give you my downloads that are coming in, in, in real time and then that's it. And I'm not a theologian, I'm not an expert, um, but I am an interested student of Kabbalah and mysticism and many other things. So um, this is just good old fashioned fun. Um, and yeah, I just thought I was really interested and I wanted to read these, the gospels, you know, the, the lost ones, and I didn't know when I'd have time. So I decided that it would be a great episode for us to do together every week. So, uh, before the Gospel of Philip, we covered the secret book of James, and uh, that is James, Jesus's brother. Can you imagine being Jesus's brother with the pressure? Uh, but yeah, that one was uh, a pretty fun book to cover. It was like scene-driven dialogue. We had some character work, uh, good times. But the Gospel of Philip has been different. The Gospel of Philip is these portions of text that are fairly cryptic and abstract and metaphorical and they're basically meant to be meditated on and mulled over and you know they're they're seeds that kind of plant in your consciousness and they will um, make more sense over time I think and so this week's portion is called God the Dyer and it's funny because I just happened to notice another portion a couple of pages later that feels very connected. So I might do that one next week. That one is called Resurrection and Baptism. And I think they're kind of connected. I mean, they're all connected, but you know what I mean? All right. Well, I'm going to read the portion to you and probably poorly and choppy and then probably read it again. And then we'll start talking about the meaning. Um, I think it's also helpful to note that sages and mystics uh, find it beneficial to study sacred texts at midnight because it provides an extra surrounding um, protection. Uh, there, there's this uh, essence called surrounding light. And the study of holy texts and speaking about the creator puts surrounding light around you. And midnight, particularly, is a very powerful time of day. The veil is very thin at this time of night uh, because it's the end of one day and the beginning of the of another. And so, the very beginning of the day is it, there's like growing positivity because it's the it's the seed level of the day. There's the most energy, and then it kind of starts depleting after the afternoon. So very um, very positive energy. At this time of night, um, there's, you know, just the, um, the ability to maybe have seeds planted in our consciousness where we can understand things on a deeper level. Um, and then also have the protection of learning and understanding without having to go through a difficult process to embody. So those are some benefits of studying in the midnight hour. And with no further ado, let's get to it, shall we? All right, so God the dyer. God is a dyer. And by the way, when, I, when I'm saying dyer, um, I know you can't see the word written out, but I'm, t I'm talking about dye, like clothing dye, like tie dyed. Um, okay, so God is a dyer. Just as the good dyes said to be genuine dyes, dissolve into what is dyed in them, so also those whom God dyes become immortal through his colors. For his dyes are immortal, and God dips those to be dipped in water. So I'm just imagining like 
us as t-shirts rolled up, you know, when you're gonna make a tie-dye <laughs> with all the rubber bands and God's dipping us in these different colors because he's dyeing us. Okay, so God is a dyer. And just as the good dyes, said to be genuine dyes, dissolve into what is dyed in them, so also those whom God dyes become immortal through his colors. For his dyes are immortal, and God dips those to be dipped in water. So, this is a metaphor, but I think that it could be helped with, the, with our buddy Chart. <laughs> chart is here. We love chart. We have deployed chart. Okay. So this is the tree of life. This is a glyph that we look at often, um, on this, uh, on secret teachings of Jesus episodes. And so just in short, this is a map of the Godhead. So this is a map of God as we can understand it. And this is also a map of reality, of the interworkings of the cosmos, like the blueprint, if you will. This is also a map of the human soul and the map of like human consciousness. These are the governing dimensions of reality. They are dimensions of consciousness and they are aspects of God. These are the aspects of the Godhead. So, these would be the dyes that they're speaking of because these are all representative. These are called spirit. And these are aspects of like archetypal parts of our being, our personality. They also represent archetypal um, events and experiences we go through and uh, things that we have to unlock and attain within ourselves. We bring these governing forces into balance so that they are virtues, virtuous and not vices, right? When they're out of balance, um, things don't function properly. There's chaos within us and then within the world at large and within our lives. So God, God is here. And so are we. And so these are the dyes. And so basically the light, let, let's know that when I say the light, when I say the creator, the light, God, the universe, these are all references to God. But God, it may be in different manifest forms. When I say the universe, that is God manifest into a physical system. Uh, when I'm saying the light, I am literally speaking of the pure essence that creation is made of, but I'm literally talking about light also. And so in the beginning, there was chaos and darkness and nothing was in formation. Everything was just void, right? And so that's what this is. This is the unmanifest world up here. These are the three negative veils of non-existence. Before reality was created, when God said, let there be light, it's like all this stuff started to happen. But before that, God was here in this endlessness. And God was just condensing energy and slowly crystallizing consciousness. And God was so overflowing that God wanted something to share with. So boom, let there be light. There was the birth of reality so that there could be other to interact with, to share with, right? So as God condensed into this singularity here, which is called the primordial point, the light became so heavy and concentrated that it burst forth through this singularity, this point here, which is called Keter. At this point, this is the first entry of the light into physical manifestation of existence. And so this light, this is God in its wholeness, in its purest form, totally unadulterated, totally unfiltered, totally un like completely um, in its full concentrate, <coughs> undiluted. 
as the light travels down this glyph and it travels through these different dimensions, you can think of these as like filters, filtration systems, or like even um, flux capacitors. If you've ever seen um, like a Tesla coil, or if you've ever built one, you need a lot of capacitors to move the energy, to transfer the energy. So in its purest form, the light is too intense for us to take in all of it. It's, it's everything. It's too much for us. We would just burn alive. It's like, I mean, think about the splitting of the atom, the atom bomb. That's just taking a bit of the light apart, right? So that is too strong. So it needs to go through these filters so that it can be reduced into more um, manageable, palatable uh, quantum, quanta. So the light is diluted and it goes through these different phases and dimensions until it reaches all the way down here, Malchut, where our physical universe is. This is the universe down here. This is the physical world where we can feel and touch things and see things. And literally all of this up here is like the heavenly realms, um, the astral realm where we dream, where ghosts are and things like that. That's all here. So all up here, this is just mysteries and, and, and all kinds of like things beyond of heaven that we don't understand of the upper realms, right? This is the Christ center here. This here, Yasad, where the dream realm is and where the moon rules, this is like where Buddhism consciousness is up this high. But up a, a step further, this is the, the Christ level of consciousness. So white light is here in its purest form. And then it is sent like almost through a prism down through the different spherot. And these, could be different colors of the rainbow, so to speak. And each color has its own frequency and each frequency and color is like an essence of God's personality um, or, or, or an archetypal essence of the human soul and personality that, you know, all of this together combines the archetypal human being. So God is a dyer. Just as the good dyes, said to be genuine dyes, dissolve into what is dyed in them, so also those whom God dyes become immortal through his colors. For his dyes are immortal, and God dips those to be dipped in water. So, now that we've understood that, like, this is the human soul, and these are the ten dimensions of consciousness within the soul, this is also a map of reality. This is a, it's like a microcosm and a macrocosm. And so the light comes in and is channeled through these different dimensions and, you know, filtered and diluted and separated and, and mixed up again. And each one represents a separate essence of God. But when they are combined together, they create experiences and uh, like rites of passage and things that we, um, we all share as mankind together. And these are um, events and, and experiences that are meant to evolve our soul through lifetimes. So basically, each one of these in its perfection is a reflection of God. But these, these dimensions, these, these spherot, they get defiled by our ego, by our fears, by... Like in the, in the language of the Bible, it would be caught like they would be talking about defiled by the powers or defiled by the, 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 the devil or demons, right? When they talk about Mary Magdalene being possessed by seven demons, it wasn't that she had, like, when you think of someone who's possessed by demons, it, it's she had the archetypal demons that we all have. We are controlled by these seven, seven of these spirits down here are the the personality pieces that we have conscious connection to these three dimensions up at the top these are pure supernal energies this is pure god like all in its wholeness this is 
pure masculinity in its unadulterated form. This is the supernal masculine. This is the supernal feminine in its unadulterated, unfiltered form. And so, you know, everything above here is beyond human consciousness. It's too abstract. It's, it's beyond what we can understand because it's not crystallized into a form. As we are at the top of the tree, things are very vague. It's very abstract. Um, it's all wholeness and everything is, you know, in unity up here. And so it's, it's like, we can't quite put a figure on it, right? We couldn't put a face on God up here. And so as the light travels down, it becomes more condensed, more organized, more organized into a thought that we can verbalize more organized into something we can envision until we get down here and things get, get more personality and they, and they get more associated with things that we can understand. <clears throat> Maths and sciences are um, created in Hod. Symphonies and art and Greek gods are starting to be organized in Netzach, right? There are so many things that are associated with each spherot. Each spherot is ruled by an archangel, and there are the choirs of angels that are associated with each spherot. Each spherot has a, an astrological association, a planetary association, colors, uh, minerals, that you can categorize almost everything in the world. It'll fall into some, some category, some association on this tree. And so as we go through our lifetimes as souls, we do what is called tikkun correction. And so we are walking these paths lifetime after lifetime, trying to bring our soul into balance, trying to die to our ego and elevate sparks of light to become more like the light of the creator. The term that we use for this is called building the vessel. This is the vessel, light and vessel. Light pours into vessel. So the, the dyes, remember, are these different dimensions. And so when we are in our purest state, our spirit self, or like think of a newborn baby before you've had any programming or impressions, you're almost, it's almost too late even as a newborn. I was dropped at the moment of birth. And so that right there, that trauma, that feeling like life won't catch me, I have to work on that. I didn't even know it was affecting me until the last couple of years. But like when I do the deep imagining and to be magnetic work where you relive your childbirth, like your, your birth experience, every time I do that one, I go into the restaurant and make like a crazy amount of money. It's crazy. So that is definitely something that has built a defense mechanism or an unconscious belief pattern in me that actually affects me and I don't even know it most of the time. So when these uh, dimensions of consciousness are undefiled, we're in our perfected state. We're in a, a state of wholeness where we are just like God. We have eternal and unwavering certainty we have unwavering compassion and love and creator consciousness and builder consciousness. And we have no fear. We have no lack. We have no doubt. We have no competitiveness. We have no jealousy or hostility or worry or insecurity. But as we separate from that pure conscious connection with the creator, the ego takes over and it starts building defense mechanisms and preconceptions and um, unconscious beliefs and limiting beliefs and selfish desires and temptation and, and all of these things. And so these governing forces get defiled. They get skewed. They get sort of they're not pure anymore. They're not pristine. They're a little bit off. And so we spend our lifetimes trying to correct this, trying to get purified again. So we get these limiting beliefs out of our mind. We get these unconscious patterns out of our operating system, right? But it takes the discipline, the discipleship of like 
attaining uh, to elevate our soul and to move toward Christ in consciousness. So let's read our portion again. And maybe it starts like by layer by layer, it's starting to make more sense. So God, the dyer, God is a dyer. Just as the good dyes said to be the genuine dyes dissolve into what is dyed in them. So also those whom God dyes become immortal through his colors. For his dyes are immortal, and God dips those to be dipped in water. Now, okay, so just as the good dyes said to be genuine dyes dissolve into what is dyed to them. So just like we were talking about, metaphorically speaking, those genuine dyes, right, are pure they're, they're concentrated, they're undiluted, they're undefiled, right? And they absorb into what is dyed in them, right? They, they really um, like soak into the wool, right? The wool, they just dissolve into the fibers, right? Because they're so pure and they're so pristine. Same too, as we like adopt our, as we build the vessel, as we let go of our limited consciousness and we break away the shells of negativity, fear, insecurity, all of those things, um, all of those negative qualities, as they disappear, it's like we become our truer essence. We don't have to take on anymore. We, we at our purest core essence are that this light, this creator, the pure dyes. It's just that we have to get the impurities out and we have to remove those. And so that is this process. That is when we start walking the path, when we start becoming a spiritual student or a spiritual seeker, what we seek to do is break away the hold, the illusion that the limited personality, that the ego, the, the small self has on, on, uh, on our higher self, right? And it's the higher self is within and it's wanting to radiate out, but it's just that we have these shells of negativity quieting that and putting a veil over that so we can't remember our, our corrected consciousness. Um, until we work at it to, to correct for what is what's off. So God is a dyer, and just as the good dyes said to be genuine dyes dissolve into what is dyed in them, so also those whom God dyes become immortal through his colors. And so as we let these these ego shells break away, we have these revelations about things and these insights, and we begin to embody these things it's like they become a part of us and it's easier. It's like our, our true nature starts to come out. And, you know, the more we break free from our limiting beliefs, it's like, oh, suddenly we see more clearly the creator and the consistency of the creator and the eternal quality of the creator. I've started to really understand the term eternal, not as a, a time, like a linear time kind of idea, like always has been, always will be. But I've started understanding that God is eternal because God is unchanging. God is unwavering. God does not, not fluctuate. God is not, you know, um, a bucket that runs out of water. It's a flowing spring always. And so that flow is always there for us to connect to, but we, the vessel, sometimes close ourselves off, you know, and, and in moments where we're really, you know, awakened, it's like we're opened up and we're in, we have affinity with the light and we can connect with it. Uh, God is a dyer, just as the good dyes said to be genuine dyes dissolve into what is dyed in them. So also those whom God dyes become immortal through his colors. And so the more that we understand God's eternal nature and how we can connect with that and what causes us to, to, to disconnect, then it grows our certainty in the creator. We have 
unwavering faith which starts to grow because we start to understand the system in which we live in and and got that god is actually dependable and like predictable to the point where you can expect god to be there and once we figure out that it's just our faith that's like cutting in and out it's like a, a weak signal right when we strengthen that the more eternal we become the more like we are in that miracle zone because we have affinity with the light of the creator. We're with the creator. So we're in that favor. We're in that, the, you know, we're in that same state of receiving, but we, you know, it's just, we have to become eternal also. And so when we are, when we have faith, like, okay, think about this. When we have hope, there's still a little bit of doubt in the background, but when we have faith, that's even stronger. It's like faith is beyond hope really. And then there's this faith beyond faith. It's called imuna. This is faith beyond reason, faith that transcends logic. And so the faith well, that we're talking about, this imuna faith, this certainty, the certainty in the creator is that whatever the circumstances are, we're not going to be too excited either way. We're not going to be afraid. We're not going to, you know, it's not going to throw us off. We are in an unwavering, unconditional, consistent state of certainty in the creator. I know whatever I'm dealing with or facing right now, the creator uh, is aware and has sent this situation. It's happening for me and not to me. And it's happening for the purpose of developing my soul in some way and helping me change and evolve. And if I stay focused on that, then no matter what the situation is, and if I keep my certainty in the creator, that the creator is moving and working in the situation, then that's when miracles happen. That's when a shitty, precarious looking situation can turn around in an instant and actually put you ahead of the game. And I've seen it happen a million times and it's so true. So the more that we build affinity with the light, the more that the light is dissolved into us and we are dissolved into the light. It's like we become one with the creator. When we dissolve away our personality and the impurities, we can finally fuse and have that holy, sacred, alchemical marriage where spirit merges with the material, where God is working through us and, and flowing through us where we are radiant beacons of the light. God is a dyer. Just as the good dyes, said to be genuine dyes, dissolve into what is dyed in them, so also those whom God dyes become immortal through his colors. For his dyes are immortal. Now, going back into the, the phrase eternal, and relating immortal to eternal. Immortal is undying. It's it's everlasting, right? Same as eternal. So I think, where did Jesus say, let all that remains be that which is eternal? Faith, hope, and love. I think that was like I think those were connected. I can't remember, but those those things are eternal. The things that are eternal are the moments that we experience genuine love between people. They are the times where we gave someone hope. They are the times where we shared compassion with someone and it changed them in a positive way. What is eternal is when we do the spiritual growth to elevate our consciousness and to change our hearts and to heal and to evolve what was once dark and selfish in us and destructive. And we change that and it's forever changed. That is, eter is eternal. That is immortal. The work that we do on our soul in this life is it lasts forever. It's forever. We never backslide after that. When we elevate ourselves, that is unchanging. And it's also interesting because when you when you think of the the law of conservation of matter in physics says that matter cannot can neither be created nor destroyed. 
And so everything that we have in the cosmos and this universe is here. And if it were to be taken away or destroyed, it would be it would cause a vacuum, a paradox. So the darkness, the density, the evil in the world, the the darkness that we're each given, the sadness, the resentment, the anger, the despair, the violence, you know, the, the craving, the neediness, all of it, that darkness, that density, we're given it. This is our this is our right to be here on earth. This is our rent for for living in the physical realm. Without the density, there would be no point to be here. Our whole purpose here is to is to grow, is to learn, is to heal and evolve and to change turn this darkness into light. And so when we transmute our own darkness within, our own fear, our own judgment, our own prejudices, our own selfishness, then we have forever changed darkness that would have perpetuated in the cosmos forever, right? If I have darkness and hostility in me and I go to the grocery store having a bad day and someone's outside the grocery store and they are begging and say it's uh, a man, and uh, an older, you know, an adult man, right? And he's, you know, if I'm having a bad day, I'm feeling hostile and I put him down, you know, I might pop off and be like, how dare he? I work so hard for my money and I'm, you know, barely making ends meet. Like, why are you asking me to help you? You know, like that would be easily if you have a bad day. Of course, we've all thought that at times, like just in a moment where like the Satan has got a hold of us and we're self-righteous and we're judging and we're forgetting that we are so blessed and lucky that any minute we could be in that person's shoes. That one bad week, one bad month, you know, depending on how you're living, you know, if you have savings set aside, how long does that last? You know, so how, what would it take to actually, how far are you from being in that same situation, right? But say that that hostility in me caused me to say something cruel to a person who's already at their rock bottom. And I would have perpetuated evil and I would have put darkness on that person and I would have created hopelessness and despair in another person. And that might have taken, they might have taken on that darkness and that sadness and that taken it on as insecurity. And they could pass it on to another person or even just you know, die with it inside of them that someone, you know, judged them so harshly, right? But if I change that hostility in me and I see that person standing there, that's going to be a different situation, right? Because what if you did a small act of kindness that then made that person feel like, whoa, even though I feel like society doesn't think I matter, this person brought me a blanket or this person remembered me and made sure to bring me some water when they came out of the store or something like that. It would make a person feel valued rather than feel like nothing. And that is that echo that perpetuates for eternity. That is immortality. When you can change something in you that changes a bit of darkness into light forevermore, that's no longer perpetuating struggle, hostility, separation, but instead creation, love, compassion, and unity. God is a dyer, and just as the good dyes, said to be genuine dyes, dissolve into what is dyed in them, so also those whom God dies become immortal through his colors, for his dyes are immortal. Now we already talked about as we ascend, we don't lose that soul work that we've done. We keep it, that's immortal. But also the interesting thing is that as we're peeling off these layers of ego and these layers of selfish personality, the me, 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 the I, 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 we, we rise in consciousness and over lifetimes and over lifetimes. So say, okay, so most of the, the masters um, in this life have only gotten to Yasad. This is where the Buddha was able to, to get um, probably some of the other um, ascended masters. Jesus is here, the Christ consciousness. 
I'm not, I don't know of anyone else who's reached Christ consciousness in our human lifetime. There may be other prophets and sages that, that did. I know that there were prophets and sages that ascended from their body. They didn't die. They just were able to leave when they were ready, when their, when their correction was done, when their tikkun was done. This is our tikkun correction is when we go through things in this life to change ourselves, right? To, to resolve our hostility so that we can, like in that example, you know, perpetuate love instead of separation. So we do this tikkun correction through this life and by building and by building and correcting the vessel by practicing restriction, we become more like the light. And as we raise in consciousness, we are stripping away the personality and we're becoming more of the universal Christ. And as we ascend, and if you go past the Christ consciousness, it's like you are no more. Your personality is no more. You are completely absorbed back into God. And so we are just the pure light of our spirit at that point. Um, now, when they said Elijah walked with God all his days and then one day Elijah was no more, Elijah went to be with God and, and Elijah was no more. It's um, Elijah was absorbed into the cosmos, into the all, into the oneness of, and the wholeness, back into union completely with divine. And then it said that Elijah was um, then made into Archangel Metatron, which is the highest angel and the right hand of God. So the idea as we ascend is that we are being absorbed back into God, back into the, the cosmos, the universe. And the more that we become like the light, the more that we have affinity with the light, the more we come into union and into that alchemical marriage with spirit and matter. And, and we, we absorb back into the light. Now, don't worry. We're at no risk of this happening um, in this lifetime. Uh, none of us are <laughs> that evolved. So don't worry, your, your personality is firmly intact for now. Um, yes, and so then it says, well, I'll just start from the beginning. God is a dyer, just as the, just as the good dyes, said to be genuine dyes, dissolve into what is dyed in them, so also whom God dyes become immortal through his colors. For his color, for his dyes are immortal, and God dips those to be dipped in water. God dips those to be dipped, so baptized those to be baptized in water. Water is a purifying medium. When you take a mikvah, you submerge yourself completely where you are floating, where your feet are not touching the bottom. Um, you are completely submerged for 10 seconds per dip and you have to you have to be in a suspended state but the water water is a powerful um, spiritual technology that is uh is used for purification um in symbolism water is a medium of spirit used for purification literally water is used for purification to wash things but in a in a literal spiritual technology sense Magically speaking, water is a purif purifying tool. It's a purification tool. So when we are baptized, it is a symbolic gesture, but also using the spiritual technology of the magic of the water, it purifies our soul with the intention of that baptism. So God is a dyer. Just as the good dyes said to be genuine dyes dissolve into what is dyed to them, so also those whom God dies become immortal through his colors. For his dyes are immortal, and God dips those to be dipped in water. So he's purifying our souls. This is the process of saving our soul. God's, God is saving our souls and purifying our souls of where the opponent, of where the, the ego has been defiled by the opponent, by you know the conditioning of life's hardships and challenges through early childhood things like getting dropped on the floor or overhearing your parents arguing about money in the other room. All of these things get implanted into our subconscious and they, they put a little stain on what was a pure droplet of divine consciousness that was completely, like when we're 
infants, we remember where we just came from. You can look at an infant and tell that. You know, that's the purified, washed soul, spirit, right? So that's what we're trying to get back to, is this purified, immortal. And the more that we save our souls, the more that we purify our souls, we elevate and we are, be that part of us, that immortal part of us is growing, you know, more into our, like it's coming more into the forefront of our consciousness. Our immortality is what we're growing towards, right? We are rising above death. Let's read it one more time. I think we're about done. God is a dyer. Just as the good dyes, said to be genuine dyes, dissolve into what is dyed in them, so also whom God dyes become immortal through his colors. For his dyes are immortal, and God dips those to be dipped in water. So, you know, hold on to these parts of you that are eternal. You know, the parts that are, that you can share that are eternal. The kindness you share amongst people. Um, genuine moments of love. Genuine moments of healing. Genuine moments of sharing and caring. Genuine moments of revelation and insight about the creator. Those things are eternal. They live on forever. And they are part of our immortality. They are a part of our immortal soul. Um, that we take with us life after life. And so all the things that we do now to purify, to dye ourselves to be more like the light of the creator, right? We want to be the full vibrant essence of each of the colors of the rainbow of the creator. I wish I had this picture, but there's um, so many times the light is shown in a, an illustration of the light, like white light being shown through um, a prism like a like a um a crystal pyramid and the light once it's refracted out of the pyramid is in its rainbow rays of violet indigo um, green red orange yellow and so those rays represent these personality aspects of god the the godhead and you know we we connect with each of those rays of colors and we adopt those, those essences, those qualities within us as well, right? God is a dyer. Just as the good dyes said to be genuine dyes dissolve into what is dyed in them, so also those whom God dyes become immortal through his colors. For his dyes are immortal and God dips those to be dipped in water. All right, y'all, that is all for tonight. I will see y'all tomorrow for our weekly energy oracle forecast. And we're actually having our company holiday party tomorrow after work. Now that we're all calmed down from the holidays, uh, right into February, we're going to have our holiday party. So we're all going to be wild tomorrow. So I won't be doing my video tomorrow night, um, but I will try to get that done before I go into work. Um, and yeah, it's, I'm going to have a cute outfit. Too bad y'all won't see it. I'm going to wear my white jumpsuit with the puff sleeves. You've seen it in some of the, the Lunation videos, I think, when I do the workshops. But, uh, yeah, maybe I'll have some fun stories for y'all, uh, for, for, for y'all after the party. I, ciao!